by If there's anything that she can do Yeah, a phone call for me She sends me if I spring the leak She mans me, I don't have to speak If she defends me, I'm drunk as a tree If I ever did see one Good luck had to stun me To the racetrack, gotta go She bet on one horse It seemed a little 
K for a lolly looking joke, you know what I mean? It did rhyme though. Ah, uh, yeah, I know, and it just would have gone right into it, and I thought, I, this is, look, how many of you are doing your very first Supernatural convention? Anybody? No, no one? be canceled by lunch. I just want you to know that. This is, these are fragile times. We used to be able to come out here, say we want, Rob would pull a whole heap of drugs out of his b-hole and voila, put on a show. Now people are all like, oh, don't pull drugs out of your b-hole. People get real squirrely about it. You know what I'm talking about, Jason. Don't I ever. It's sensitive. It's a sensitive time. I'm just trying to hang on till the catered lunch shows up. I can get some chicken piccata, and then they'll, they'll escort me out of here with my banker's box of office goodies. <laughs> Off I'll go, and Jason will take over. And at that point, it'll be a family-friendly event. But until that happens, God is my witness, even though God's not here. I will probably be canceled. And not because I don't love. Not because I don't care. I'm contractually obligated to care. It's in my contract. You must give a shit. Okay? Yeah, okay, gotta do that. Gotta clock in. Gotta care. Jason cares naturally. It just happens to him. He grew up kind. He grew up nice. He made his parents proud. And I'm proud of him. I mean, look at him. He's a stand-up guy. This is everybody for a hot second. How many of you are visiting from a country that isn't the United States? Anybody? Okay. I'm going to do you a favor because you may not get to see all 50 states. You may not get to see every part of this great nation. So I want to tell you something right now. You don't have to leave this GD room to understand the United States of America because that right there, leaning against that dais, that right there, get out of here! Don't you, don't you even think about it. That right there, that's America. That's a, that's a right, am I wrong? Not you, you're a robot. By the way, you'll be taking over the world soon, so congratulations. But you, in the boots and the jeans, got your hand in your pocket, got a tee on, that's a comfy ass tee, mofo. That's a comfy tee. Sir, you want a size down? Do I look like I'm from Italy? No, I'm from America. I'll take the larger one. Thank you very much. Got a nice lean on the lectern? You just, when you go home and you take all these pictures of Jason like you're doing right now, just get your little marker out and go, eh! Take that microphone out, draw a little beer in there, boom, that's America, everybody. You're looking at it. Oh, say, can you? I'm telling you that you don't get more American than Jason Mann's right now. Now, also, when you're doing your little Get rid of the lectern. Get rid of that lectern. Draw in a pickup truck. Now, I know it's going to be weird because two of the tires will be dangling in midair. <laughs> don't, don't get the belt down in the details. The point is, Jason Mann's, with a beer in his hand, leaning on a truck, is America. He is freedom. He will be the one. I love you. Yeah, we're close. Dude. We talk all the time. We're fam families and friends. But he's got a responsibility. Yeah, you got to do what you got to do. He just can't let me come out here and run amok. No, sir. Parameters. Lines in the sand. Dude got a beer in his hand. He's leaning on a truck. Don't believe me? Look at the doctored photos online. Don't believe what you see. Believe what we do later to the photo. That's the truth. And that... America. And that is what this weekend's all about. You're going to get to experience the entire thing. All that America has to offer this weekend. And you're going to do it while tapping your toes to the delectable musical delights of Loud and Swain back here to my left. Are you drunk, kid? A man who, like myself, also can never get picked up at the airport by a driver. That's Stephen Norton right there. On the bass guitar, and I'm not kidding if you're new to the circuit, uh, the 
this is Robot Mike, and we've always made fun of Robot Mike, ah uh ha, -huh, Robot Mike, and we wouldn't let Robot Mike go to dinner with us, and Robot Mike had to, you know, we folded it up in his case and put him in the belly of the airplane. Now, thanks to AI, he writes our checks. Ladies and gentlemen, that is Robot Michael Borja! And on the guitar, how many of you ladies in the house are married? Well, then I want to open this morning with an apology. An apology, you have a good man or woman at home who loves you. I know that, you know that, your family knows that. We're through. Jason's your biggest supporter. He loves what you two have going on. But there's not a damn thing we can do about what you're going to feel in 72 hours after watching this man play guitar. It's going to do things down under that you didn't know shouldn't be done unless it was by a medical professional. And there's nothing we can do about it. It's just going to happen. So let go and let God with Mr. Billy Moran on the guitar. I saw the show of hands. I do pay attention occasionally. How many of you are here for your first Friday? Good. Guess the returning Friday people. I love the Friday people because this is where it all happens. Now you get all the inside jokes. No one will appreciate in 48 hours, but you will because you get it. And we're gonna we're gonna honor that. We're gonna celebrate that by kicking it off with one of our favorite guests. Are you ready? Are you ready, Friday people? Because this man is Mr. Friday. He is the anchor of Friday. He is the ballast that keeps the ship afloat. Ladies and gentlemen, round of applause for Mr. DJ I'm a little uh, jet lagged. I went to uh, Japan and then to Thailand. And uh, my friend got me drunk and taught me to change in my flight or canceling my flight. So I only had like two days to prepare and get here. So I'm a little all over the place. But yeah, who's ever seen me in a panel before? So you know. It'll be like that, but worse. Okay, so uh, I was talking about this. I, I did a meet and greet early this morning. And, you know, it's great to travel to all these cultural differences. You learn a lot about yourself. You learn a lot about the world. It makes the world smaller. Um, one thing that I learned, I learned a lot about supportive underwear in the tropics. You need them. For those of you who don't have testicles, which is, that's a lot of you, let me tell you a little bit about them. There's something called chafing, of which I was previously unaware. Um, because I've never been in heat like that. So the, so the hottest month of the year in Thailand is May. That's why we went, because everything was like $8. And so, but the thing is, after a day there, I'm like, ouch, it hurts to walk. So I went to, uh, I went to a department store, um, found some underwear. The sizing is different, right? I'm an extra large there. Um, but, but they're still like <laughs> that wide. And I'm like, where does your penis go in here? 
also they could be like this. Bought 17 pairs of them, wear them every day. Okay, uh, so guys, we're gonna play uh, a little game show I like to call the World's Shittiest Game Show. Has anybody ever played that before? <laughs> World Shittiest Game Show. So I'm going to pick a number between 1 and 125, and every time you, and write it down, every time you ask me a question or engage me in any way at either one of the microphones, you get, you write your name down, I write your name down, you guess a number, guess at the number, and we're, you win something out of my bag. It's really shitty. I, don't, I, don't, I cleaned out my bag, so let's see what's in here. Hold on. Let's see what's in here. Hey! Uh, Kleenex, can't have those in Edom. My favorite pen. Nope. Oh, that's the keys to my house. That's more of a second date thing. Um, let's see what else we have here. Uh, so, oh, sour candy. You can't have this because, do you, so I have anxiety, and uh, somebody told me that eating sour candy in anxious situations helps control anxiety, and it, it does. It works. So I bought spray, <laughs> spray sour candy, and it's, it's really, it's amazing. I still needed my Klonopin though, hold on one second. Um, here's <laughs> vitamin C. See, before the pandemic, I used to be able to give somebody like a handful of Tums, but now that's not hygienic and we could all die from that. So, hold on, let's see what else. Hold on, I'm gonna put this down. I bought this for one euro. I'm a pouch person. I used to be a wallet person, but I've switched to pouches, and it really has changed my life. This is a, a pouch that has the Parthenon on it in gold lame. It says grease on it. I think that's, that'll be a contender. Um, I just got a pouch. Pouch. I'm, I'm pouch for life now. Pouches. Pouches are better than wallets, let me tell you. And they look better in your pocket. Um, so this is a contender. I'll put it, I won't put it on the symbol because I don't own those. Uh, let's see what else. This is, okay, so you'll have a choice of two prizes. This is a license plate shaped pin. This is Washington DC SPN 2022. I hope somebody here didn't give me this. Um, <laughs> but I've had, it, I've had it for a year, so it, I, I've, I've loved it. And you can, so you can either get that. So you can have grease, or you can have a re-gift. I'm sure the person was very lovely and thoughtful, and thank you very much. Um, <laughs> So let's get started on the World Shittiest Game Show. Uh, I'm gonna pick a number right now between one and 125. Actually, I, I'm gonna make it 150 this time. Let's up the stakes here. Okay, the number is, what should it be? Hold on, let me think. Uh, okay, got it. It's a hard one. Okay. Inka binka bottle of ink, the cork fell off and you sink. Over here. Does anybody else do that? No, just me? <laughs> That's what I thought. Hello, how's it going? Good, good morning. My question is, uh, what is the most memorable thing about Breaking Bad? Oh, wow. Okay, uh, I, that, I know immediately what the most memorable thing about Breaking Bad is. Oh, by the way, I, so I stole like six bags of that blue meth. Um, that's not the most memorable thing. Um, because I saw that they weren't marked or labeled, they just had a bunch of them on a table, so I crammed a bunch of them in my pockets. I steal everything from sets. <clears throat> um, the most memorable thing was, so Brian Cranston had just won the Emmy, um, and his first day back with the Emmy, uh, to show everybody and thank everybody, um, was my first day on set. And so we're shooting in this, in this park, and our base camp was in a field, and I never met Brian, so I went up and he introduced himself to me and thanked me for being on the show. Um, and then he was like, hey, do you want to hold it? I'm like, yeah, I've never held an Emmy. And it's so much heavier than I thought, it slipped through my hand and I dropped it. I dropped Brian Cranston's Emmy. And he just won it. But he told me he dropped it. He dropped it the night he, that he won it too, so it made me feel a little better. And I was wearing uh, like boots, and we were in a grass field, so I was able to get my foot real fast underneath it, so it didn't hurt it. But, it, but the, that, how many ever nanoseconds it took for it to hit the ground was like, my heart fell apart. Like I was like, I'm so sorry, Brian Cranston, I dropped your Emmy! Um, so that's my most memorable thing. Um, that was a very hard scene to shoot because there was, um, 
there w it was only one camera. And so like, it was a single camera, seven minute scene. And so it starts out here, the camera goes out on a crane and there's like, you know, people walking dogs. And it's like, what if that, that guy could be a cop, the guy in the florist or somebody walking by with balloons. So if we messed up the dialogue, everybody in the background had to reset. It took like 30 minutes. So we messed up a few times, but we get to the place where I have to pull the boot out of my gun, I mean my gun out of my boot, and it kept getting caught. So the director comes over and he's like, I don't understand how this is happening. Your legs are this big and the boots are, I was like, hey, I know they are that. Um, but he was like, how, and, and what, what we realized though was that at the bottom of the boot, there was a little leather thing and when you did it slowly, it didn't catch, but when you pulled it, it pulled the top of the gun and it wouldn't come out. Anyway, that was the most memorable thing. I dropped Brian Cranston's Emmy. I remembered that story from start to finish. I answered your question, which will probably never happen again. Um, oh shit, I don't have a pen. Oh, wait, I must have a pen, because I wrote something down earlier. Okay, um, what's your name and your guess? Jesse, 86. What is it? Jesse, 86. Jesse, 86, perfect. My pants are falling down. Um, Oh, I got pantsed by a monkey. Um, so I was I'm wearing resort wear, and resort wear is awesome. I mean, you know, gauzy things. And I was wearing these linen pants, and I went to a monkey feeding place. It's called Monkey Temple, actually. And the alpha monkey came out. He's like, they're, they're this big, right? They're like little miniature macaws. And so he comes over. Is it macaw? Is that a bird? It's a bird. Yeah, it's a bird. Well, it starts with an M, and it sounds like that. Macat, is that what it is? Perfect, thank you. Um, so, but, so he came over and I gave him the first banana, but then I started handing out other banana and little pieces of corn, and he would go over there and literally bitch slap the, the, the other monkey and take it from him, like slap like a person would. I wouldn't, but you know how you do. And so, and so, so then I would give him a banana and then start giving out bananas to everybody else while he was eating so he wouldn't get all crazy. And then I had enough of this guy because he would just sit, sit in front of me and be like, give me a banana. So I give him a banana and I gave him my last, not the last one I had, I had like seven left. And I'm walking back to my friends and he comes right up to me and pants me. Pulled my, both hands, pulled my pants down. No word of a lie. And I was wearing these tiny little underwear that I just bought. Um, uh, that really happened. Uh, hi. Hi. We were the only people there, though, because it was very hot. Um, and my friends have seen all that before. Chafing is not unique to uh, male anatomy. It's not? I don't have female parts. I don't know. I only know what I have, and clearly I don't know much about them. I just wanted you to know there's a product called Sport Shield, and it seems like a little roll-on deodorant that you just... No way, Sport Shield. Let me write that down. Yeah. <laughs> Seriously. Sport Shield. Shield. You can find it on Amazon. Okay, okay. Okay, I'm all about it now. Thank you. Well, that's enough, Krista. What's your guess? Okay. 42 Sport Shield. Hmm, I'm interested in this project, this product. Oh, but it doesn't have aluminum oxide in it, though. I just recently learned that deodorant and, and antiperspirant were the same thing. And then I read, and deodorant, antiperspirant, I've always worn it, and it has aluminum oxide in it, and now I'm worried that the aluminum oxide in it is gonna give me Alzheimer's, because of all these studies. So now I'm eating a lot of berries, because there's another study that says that counteracts that. So, find me later. <laughs> What is your favorite genre of music? Genre of music? Oh, that's, I love, love, love 80s pop. I love it. Um, there's a, like, yeah, I really do. I don't, I don't have, I think my musical knowledge probably stops in the 90s or early 2000s. Like, I, I don't know who anybody is right now. Um, after Kelly Clarkson won American Idol, it all went shit for me. Like, I don't know who, any, I don't know who anybody is. Um, but that, that, I can't, and I love to dance. Love, love, love to dance. And, and come tonight, you'll see some of it. Um, if you don't come tonight, I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna remember all your faces. I have a photographic memory and I will find you. <laughs> also, it's the most fun you can have and it's a completely free event. And the theme is animal. And I, I spent so much time getting this costume together. And I'm so proud of it. It's, it's, aw it's awesome, I can't wait. I can't wait. What were you talking about? Did you did I answer your question? Yes, you did. What was it? You got a favorite genre of music. Oh, 80s pop! 
love it. Uh, my favorite song to get ready to in the morning is Big Country from the album Big Country by the band Big Country. You know that song? In a big country, dreams. Yeah, it's like, love it, love it, love it. And I love Duran Duran. Uh, what's your name and your guess? Uh, Liz and 106. Liz and 106. Okay. Thank you so much for playing the World Shittiest Game Show. Hey there. Hello. Uh, what can you tell me about the show that you just did? Um, you and Julian Richards was on the same one, um, the Cabinet of Curiosities. Oh yeah, I played a giant rat thing. Did you see it? Yeah. I played a rat, a guy from the 1600s that got cursed and, and turned into like a rat-like creature, a rat with a human head. Or quasi human head. I had to learn how to speak in, a, uh, in an accent, like with the guess of that accent. It sounds like Irish with a Canadian part of it, right? It's kind of like, it's actually kind of sounded like Tom Cruise's Irish accent in Far and Away. Why can't you say it like the hot shot and I worked hard, I've earned it? You're not wearing a hat, Joseph. Why can't you say it like the hot? It's kind of like, it actually kind of was like that. Um, but it was very fun. I had six hours of prosthetic makeup a day. And they weighed eight pounds of like of latex. So I had to wear a neck brace. Um, it was amazing. And I actually just did my own movie. I just starred in and produced my company's first movie, and we just finished it. Thank you so much. I had 77 employees. Like I was the boss. I had the keys. Um, but I had heavy prosthetics in that too. And but we couldn't afford people that knew how to take them off. So like I have so much damage. My hairline was bleeding. Um, I'm actually going. I'm leaving Chicago for Vancouver to stay with Ty Olson while I get. You know what micro needling is? It's where they put a hundred thousand tiny holes in your face, um, and then you look ten minutes younger. Um, <laughs> after three weeks of looking terrible, um, I'm going to have that done. Um, but it was the best experience, that was the best experience of my life, not the Juliet, not the, uh, the, uh, the, what's that, Cabinet of Curiosity show. Um, that was amazing though, because the cool thing was Guillermo del Toro designed our prosthetics for free for the movie that my company did, because he and I have become friends. And uh, he's, a, he's an amazingly creative man, he's a genius. Um, you can't understand a word that he says. Um, he came and, uh, he didn't direct my episode, but he came and directed me because he didn't like what the director did. So I had to go through that process twice, like three months apart, and he would just, he would say this, say this very long sentence, and I'm wearing rat teeth, and have all this, like, can barely move my face, and he's like, yeah, say, say this, 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 very fast, in a hard Spanish accent, so a hard Mexican accent, I'm like, I don't understand what you're saying, and also, you, would, could you talk to me without a mouthful of cheeseburger just one time, please, I can't understand a word you're saying, and he laughed, and it made us good friends. Um, Anyway, my movie's called Evil Lou and will be out at some point in the future, and I'm very excited about it. I know you didn't ask about it, but I'm very excited. What was it? Oh, our payroll company screwed us, and I had a mutiny. They all, everybody tried to leave so that I came with a checkbook. It was, so many things happened. It was awesome and scary. And I was the boss. What was it called again? Uh, evil Lou. I play Lou. It's about the world's most evil, man, mean man, and he finds love. Because love fixes everything. It really does. And... Uh, and then some bad things happen. It's kind of like a, a surrealistic romantic comedy. Congratulations. Thank you so much. Um, I've seen some rough cut footage of it and I'm pretty proud of it. Hey, what's your name and your guest? Uh, Stacy, 22. Stacey. Does everybody say Stacy's mom has got it going on to you? Yes. I, I know, I know, I know. I'm, I'm one of them too. I'm what's not, your guess? I'm not mad at it. I'm not mad at it. What's your guess? Uh, 22. 22. Stacy's mom has got it going on. Uh, somebody should request that tonight. I'll, I'll dedicate it to you if they do. <laughs> Hello? I know that's how I feel with microphones, too. Hi. Hi! Listen to how loud we are. What's your favorite color? What's my favorite color? That's a great question. My favorite color is green. What's your favorite color? Purple? Purple's a great color. I love purple. Uh, what's my favorite color to wear, though, is red. But it's hard to have red clothing if you don't have a lot of it because it turns everything else red. <laughs> a lot of my t-shirts, my white t-shirts, are now red because of one red shirt. I like to wear pink shoes. You like to wear pink? 
Pikachu. Pikachu? Oh, is Pikachu yellow? <gasps> I love yellow. It makes me look dead, but I, I love it. I actually was gonna wear I was gonna wear a yellow belt, but I left it on my nightstand, and I'm upset about it. But I love you. Look great. What's your name? I'm Natalie Twenty. Your name's Natalie. Twenty. I'm DJ. Nice to meet you. Hi. How old are you? Tell me? Four. Four? I've been 38 for a very long time, and my birthday's coming up, and I'm going to be 38 again. Um, uh, so, uh, Natalie, I have one question for you. Can you tell me a number? Yeah. Tell me a number. One fourteen. One fourteen. Thank you, Natalie. You are adorable, but that is not your best quality. Okay, here we go. Thank you for playing the world's crappiest game show. See how I cleaned it up. Natalie. 114. Adorable. It makes me want children. I do not want children, but it makes me want children. Hi, I'm a fellow member of Team Pouch. Right on. Pouches awesome. are the best. They're the best. Um, so for the show, The New Guy, have yeah. you considered rebooting, renewing, sequeling, rebooting, all the different things that Hollywood does these days, and what would you change about it? Oh, wow. Would you, would you I hate it? remakes so bad. What, what they did to Overboard is criminal. What they did to Arthur is criminal. Um, those are great movies that should... And they're remaking Big Trouble in Little China, I heard. I know! Stop messing with my childhood! Um, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to mess with anybody else's childhood, too. So when I was growing up, there was a movie called Can't Buy Me Love with Patrick Dempsey. You may ever see that movie? I love it so much. It's the movie, whenever it's on television, I can't not watch it. So the new guy has become the Can't Buy Me Love for another generation. Because they have similar themes, except in one, he buys somebody. <laughs> and, and my character didn't do that. He wooed somebody and lied to her. So I guess it's not great either. Um, but I don't like messing with people's childhood and memories. Hey, y'all. Welcome. I love it how people like, 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 like you're hiding in some way. We can see you. Um, uh, but welcome. Yeah, so I wouldn't want to remake it. Also, I wouldn't want to do a sequel because it would probably be called The Old Guy. And I'm trying to... <laughs> I mean, we also do go with the new guy, unless he had a kid who was also the new guy, the new guy too, the new guy also. No, I don't think so. No, I kind of also feel like whenever I do something, I sort of like have that experience and I'm ready to move on. Like I've never been on a show long term, like having to, having to be there every day, but I understand like at the end of it, you feel like it's a big chunk of your life. Like people are on CSI or Supernatural, you know, that was 15 years. Um, I was sad when Supernatural was, was no longer with us because uh, I wasn't there every day. But uh, 15 years of anything is a long, long, long time. I don't remember why we were talking about this. Um, what's your name and your guess? My oh, the new guy. Nope. <laughs> my name is Jen and my number is 26. But I made the new guy because my mother wouldn't let my sister watch Road Trip because it was <laughs> dirty. And so I, went, we, I cleaned it up for my sister. and. Uh, and she was like 12 at the time, I think. What's your, what's your guess? 26. 26. I mean, I think the movie's pretty clean. I think the most, I think the, the most, I, the only thing that happens is I try to take my belt off to have sex with Sonny Mabry, but it never happens. Um, she's married to Ethan Embry. Do you know who Ethan Embry is? Yeah, Sonny is now married to Ethan. Small world. Hi, I'm DJ Qualls. Welcome to the World Shittiest Game Show. Hi. Um, so in what ways would you say you're similar or different to Garth? Oh, well, you know, they wrote Garth for me. Did you know that? They did. They wrote him with me in mind, and I turned it down initially. <laughs> um, I, I know, I just come off of doing a movie with Sandra Bullock all about Steve, um, and I was so tired that they, they called me like, hey, do you want to go to Vancouver on Thursday? And I went, nope. I absolutely do not want to. I, I, need, I need a rest. Um, but then uh, Jared reached out to me. He, I casually known him before the show and told me that they wrote it with me in mind and uh, gave him a lot of my attributes. And, uh, and, and then they wrote for me as the character as it went on. He's much more patient than I am. I'm learning to be patient and 
my goal this year is to be more patient and less reactive, and it works like four to five times. <laughs> I'm still a bit reactive. Um, I, wa I want to be that person. Um, but I think I'm mellowing into him as I get older. Like, I'm harder to anger. I realize when things are not about me, I'm able to gently tell people things. Like, my friend Theo has mice problem, and so I have to talk to him about that. Because <clears throat> I think the avoidance is from depression. So I'm, I'm getting much more compassionate, slowing my life down, and taking more time to deal uh, with other people's stuff also. So, yeah, that's it. That's the answer to that question. And I remember the whole thing. Um, what's your name and your guess? Um, my guess is 83. 83. And my name is Brasia. What is it? Brasia. Frasia? Uh, you can just say Asia. Like Asia? No, but no, what's the first letter? Uh, it's B as in boy. Brasia? Yeah. I got you. I like it. Brasia83, thank you for playing the World Cheatest Game Show. Wherever you are, hello. Hello. Whispering. Tell me. Hi. Nope, can't tell you. Um, so I'm, I'm re I, right now I'm in the middle of rewatching Lost. Okay. And it was so lovely to see you. Yeah. Lost. Thank so you. I was wondering if you could maybe talk a little bit about your experience when you were on Lost and have you heard anything about the recent uh, sort of controversy about Lost and what was it like on the set of Lost? No, but I'll tell you everything because I know some things. I'll tell you some dirt. Um, enough time has passed so I can spill everything. So, I get there. Me and Katie Seagal fly out. I'd known Katie Seagal for years. Uh, we were in a movie together earlier in my career, or maybe it was after. No, it was before. And so I had done a movie with Jorge Garcia um, right after he did the pilot for Lost, before anybody knew anything about Lost, and he told me about it, and he said it was the most expensive pilot ever made, at the time which was $7 million, which now is laughable. $7 million is nothing to make a pilot. And I was like, dude, you're going to be a giant star. This is going to be huge, right? And then it came out and was giant. So then, in the second season, I think it was the second season, they called me and said, hey, um, do you want to come and be Jorge's best friend from his past life, in his flashbacks, um, I was like, absolutely, it's in Hawaii, you get to go out for two weeks to your episode. So me and Katie get there, and we're staying at a hotel connected to a mall, two things I love, hotels and malls, and with a rooftop bar that sells $2 pina coladas. I'm literally in heaven. And so I go for my first day, my filming, everybody's lovely, it's a mostly Hawaiian crew, it's gorgeous, the sets, they, they took me around and showed me the beach set, which was inside. Like, it was crazy. Like, in all the jungle stuff, everything's, like, all the, like, undergrowth, everything's made of rubber for the camera. So you're walking on, like, gravel or whatever, or, like, mulch, and it doesn't make any noises. They just showed me all the secrets. <coughs> then, uh, I had a, a, my first, like, maybe my second day, I had a night shoot, and the script supervisor, the, you know what a script supervisor is? So the person that sits beside the camera to make sure that, like, if I put my hand in my pocket when I say this line, that every time, or I take keys, it's in my right hand, that if I take in my left hand, it's like, last time, it was in your, it's always in your right hand. They, and it's the hardest job on set. I could never be a script supervisor, because you're watching camera move, you're watching lighting, you're watching continuity for wardrobe, continuity for everything, plus you're trying to keep us on script. And you have to be present enough when we do this. Hey, can you give me that line? They have to know it immediately, otherwise the actor gets pissy, right? It's a hard, hard job. This group script supervisor, though, was evil. And so <laughs> if I said A and it was the, she was on me. And so um, I, had, I had enough of it. So finally I was like, are you a producer on this? And she was like, no, I'm a script supervisor. I was like, I, I'm DJ Qualls, nice to meet you. Um, they, they didn't hire me to come here and just puke out lines, and also this is not Shakespeare, it's lost. And I was like, so just, if, if I get 95% of the line and the intent, I think we're good, right? Is that okay? Because it was really, because if somebody starts doing that, you start, and I had a lot of things to say, you start forgetting your lines. And forgetting your lines in front of a crew that's not your crew is horrible. It's like you're playing in somebody else's backyard um, when, you're, when you guest star, and it's a lot of pressure on guest stars. That's why whenever I'm a regular on a show, I'm always like, thank you for doing the show, thank you for being here. And the, one of the good things about being on Supernatural is that nobody ever feels like a guest star. Um, you never feel like you're playing in somebody else's yard, at least I didn't. And, uh, and most of the people I've talked to felt very at home there. Anyway, so her and I 
got into a little bit of a bickering thing. I did start, I did trip up a bit. The next day, we were told, me and Katie are supposed to be picked up at like 9.30 in the morning. Nobody shows up. Nobody comes. And we're, we're texting and calling and nobody's responding to us. And then we find out that the next night, the script advisor did the same stuff to Michelle Rodriguez and she punched her. She did too. I told you. And so, and so, and so then they're like, so we, they had to shut the set down. Then uh, they came to get us the next day. And then that night, Daniel Day Kim got a DUI. And then they were shut down the next day. So we're just, up, we're just like, we're just drinking $2 pina coladas on the roof. And then we got into a pattern of them saying that they were, we're, we're shut down today, we'll see you tomorrow. Then they would, next day, shut down, we'll see you tomorrow. So two, one episode took two weeks, I mean uh, six weeks to film. It's supposed to be two weeks, right? And so we're just up there every day just getting hammered. And, oh, and, and then after Daniel Day Kim got his DUI, Michelle Rodriguez got a DUI. You remember all that? Punching somebody and a DUI the same week. I do kind of like her, though. Um, I've known her for years, and she's a good friend of mine. Um, and doesn't mind if I tell you this story. I don't know Daniel, though, so he may mind this. Um, but then... Uh, I, somebody told me because all the secrets start coming out because I start seeing the crew out like man at the grocery store I'm like what's going on I'm like did you know this did you know this <laughs> and somebody told me that they had written themselves into a corner and they were reading the message boards for suggestions about how to get out of it <laughs> yes lost they were lost <laughs> yep so finally my manager had to pull me out because I had another job Oh, and here's another tidbit. Originally, I did two episodes, but my character killed himself in the second one, and it, and they realized that that would make them hate the audience would hate Jorge. And what's his name on the well, on the show? Hurley. Yeah, that they would hate Hurley. So um, then they just said off camera that me and his girlfriend ran away to like I don't know to open up bed and breakfast in Pasadena. I don't know what we did. <laughs> What, what, well, I, don't I don't remember what, how, how we got out of that, but we did. But there's some, there's some gossip. Uh, and we're going to Hawaii this year. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go see if there, maybe I'll try to do a side of it and see if I, get, if I can get a group of you guys to go see if there's those two dollar uh, pina coladas are still there. Um, what's your name and your guess? Tammy. And Tammy. 56. Where are you from, Tammy? I am from Champaign, Illinois. Oh, right on. You, don't, you don't have much of an accent. Okay. Usually I can tell. Usually I can tell. No, when people say Tammy, so say this word. How do, okay, hold on. Let me write it down. Here's, here's how I test all Midwesterners. Okay. R-O-U-T-E. Okay, say this word. I'm, com I'm coming to you. She's going to know the number. See, I, was, I can't tell you what the word is because um, then you'll say it just like I do. Say this word. Challenge. Oh, yeah, they, you, you passed the test. Because usually people in the Midwest say challenge. It was a real challenge. <laughs> How was your day? It was a real challenge to get through it. But, and even people who like are on the news are like, they're like, this is Diane Walter reporting live for Channel 5 News. Today was a real challenge. Um, like, <laughs> it's, they, 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 you can't get away from it and you can't hear it. Anyway, Tammy, thank you so much. That, this was not a challenge. Or a challenge. Hi, DJ. Hi. I hope this question isn't a challenge for you. <laughs> I love a callback. <laughs> In the Winchesters, Dean is able to tra um, travel through the multiverses. And I was wondering, if he were to meet your character in a multiverse, would you still be Garth, or would you want to play a different character or a different a monster? Oh, that's interesting. Um, in the multiverse, do you, uh, uh, so explain to me exactly, I kind of know what a multiverse is. Somebody was actually talking to me about this recently. Um, I saw this movie, one of the Clover Fields or whatever it is, and there's a, there's a multiverse thing happening there. Uh, the, the concept is very interesting to me. So, and also a Man in the High Castle, we had a multiverse going on, and my character existed in two different worlds. Um, you're, 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 Garth is somewhere else, right, being Garth? But maybe in that world he didn't get bitten by a werewolf. So that's, that's the Garth, because when he got, I got bit by a werewolf, I couldn't hunt anymore. The reason why they turned me into a werewolf, I was supposed to do more episodes of the show, but I got Man in the High Castle, and a series regular versus a guest star, like 
you have to take that job, right? It's a regular paycheck and all that. Um, and then when I got turned into a werewolf, I was like, t I was sad that I couldn't, when I would go back, I wasn't wearing my hunter coat. So I asked the producers if they would kill Bess, my wife. And it was the only way because he would never leave. He would never leave his family to go hunt again because it's too dangerous, right? He'd move beyond that. But if she died, I thought maybe I could go back. But turns out that's not a popular suggestion. Hey, could you kill my wife? They don't love it. Um, and they didn't do it. Thank God. Um, that's why I'm not a writer. Um, but yeah. I, would, I, I can't imagine being anybody else on the show but, my, but Garth. And it's funny because myself, that's, I, you know, I said myself. Um, I, I answer to it in public whenever I'm, at least one time, every time I'm out, somebody yells me across the parking lot or something, hey Garth. When I get a new movie, Garth gets a new TV show or gets a new movie, you know what I mean? So it's, it's become very much ingrained in my own, how, like my own identity. So I would only ever want to be Garth. Or maybe Ellen. I, I really like Sam Ferris. She's fun to get drunk with. She tried to get out of a plane once when we were over the Atlantic Ocean, or Pacific Ocean. Did I ever tell you this story? Okay, I'm flying to New Zealand. Don't tell her I told you this. And uh, do not film this. And, and well, you, I don't give a hell. I don't give a damn. Um, so listen. Um, I was flying to New Zealand to do a Comic Con once, and I, I'm brand new to this whole Comic Con thing. And only, I think I'd only done like maybe one or two episodes of Supernatural at this point, so I didn't even know the cast very well. And I'm sitting in a, on a plane to Auckland from Los Angeles, and I hear a commotion and see a woman sitting by the window um, who, do, uh, who does this move, 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 D gets get into the aisle, drunk as hell and and then does this gets back takes her purse then gets back past the people goes over to the exit door and tries to open it that really happened and i'm like who is this like, ah, all belligerent they're like ma'am we will have to restrain you if you don't go sit down and she did and so then I'm like, God, that person's crazy. And so then th when the plane lands, I'm all bleary eyed and I'm dragging my luggage over to, to, to the meeting place and she's there. And I'm like, oh my God, she's with us. <laughs> and then she was my drinking partner for the whole rest of that trip. She was awesome. Um, and it bonded us forever. Once you see somebody try to get out of a plane, and it wasn't in a scary way. She, when they told her to stop, she stopped. She did not keep trying to get out of the plane. She was like, okay, fine. Um, so she, she wasn't a belligerent drunk. She just didn't want to be there anymore, and I get that. It's a long flight. What's your guess and your name? My guess is 29, and my name is Elizabeth. Elizabeth, thank you so much. Aren't, these panels are like truth serum for me. I, I'll tell anything. I'll tell, I tell stuff on everybody. Don't do anything to me because I'll talk about it in a panel. Um, my question is, what's your favorite go-to movie to relax? What do you like to watch? Um, I, you know what? I, as far as watching TV, I watch TV to relax. Um, there's, a, a, there's a Canadian and Canada and England both have versions of this show. It's called Come Dine With Me. Do you know this yeah. show? Oh. It's where five people get together and they each host, have to host a dinner party on a night. It's, it's like... It's like uh, what, what sodium pentothal, the thing they give you when you have surgery to put you to sleep. I cannot stay up through an episode of that. Um, it's either that or I will read and listen to rain sounds. There's a channel on YouTube that's just, it's rain noises, and that puts me out. But as far, if something is a narrative, it's really hard for me to fall asleep to it. But if it's like reality-based, I also love Antiques Road Trip. It's not road show, it's road trip. Two experts get 400, no, 200 pounds, and then they go and buy antiques, and at the end of the week, they sell them at auction, and whoever has the most money wins. I love it. It's like crack to me. Um, that's probably why I'm single, because um, I can't stop talking about it to people. Um, but I love it. But yeah, I really don't have a go-to movie. Um, but I love the movie Soap Dish. That's something I can watch over and over again. Can't Buy Me Love and Overboard are my three go-to go-tos just to watch. Um, I hear people coming. Um, what's your name and your guess? Uh, my name is Stacy and 120. Hey, does anybody ever think Stacy's mom has got it going on to you? <laughs> All right, I thought so. Stacy's mom has got it going on. Holy Hello? God. Deja vu. Hi, DJ. Hi. Um, okay, so you said you take a prop from every movie, every show. 
right? Yeah. Okay, so I just have to ask what you took from road trip. I had those giant underwear. <laughs> There is, there's two pairs of them. There's one is in the, the Hard Rock Hotel in Vegas in a frame, and I have the other pair. And I'm actually, right now, still have been in, litig in this weird lit litigation thing with the uh, Planet Hollywood in Orlando, because they have my full outfit, and it actually belongs to me. Um, and Supernatural sold my hunter coat for $11, and didn't, wouldn't let me have it. What? I'm still mad about that. Um, and my chair back, you know the little thing that, they, that has your name on it? They, they sold that at a uh, yard sale. I didn't go to get to go to that yard sale. I didn't even know there was a yard sale. Now I'm mad about that all over again, like it just happened. Thank you, what's your name? Kirsten. What is it? Kirsten. Like Thanks, Kirsten. Um, what's, uh, what's your guess? 129. 120 what? One, oh, sorry. <laughs> just got punched in the mouth of the microphone, but it's all good. 129. 129. Um, I almost knocked my front tooth out with a bottle once, if that makes you feel any better. Um, okay, guys, they're coming. They're here. Thank you so much for playing the World Shittiest Game Show. The, the, I hope you had fun. Did you have fun? Um, so the answer, the number was 143, and Krista, you got it. Um, Sports Shield. This is brought, this, the World Shittiest Game Show was brought to you by Sports Shield. It prevents chafing. Thank you guys so much. Krista, come up and get your dinner. You fellas, only for the men. Sorry, ladies. Um, I mean, I've been with the band too long. <laughs> this is for you guys. Um, I told you I'd get canceled before lunch. Um, Rachel Miner no. is being zapped in from her home to be here with us right here. So when you have a question for Rachel Miner, you're going to line up in the center. We do it differently. We don't do the sides. You come up this middle area. Yeah, you and you're going to talk to Rachel Miner. Yeah. She's going to talk to you. This works phenomenally well. Again, Robot Mike, when you take over the world, because you're a robot, That's right. I think Rachel will be your bride. That's because uh, she's also flexing her digital superpower. I love her. But, <laughs> all right. Now, Mike just got canceled. This is going to be a three-man operation for the rest of the day. That's not good. Ladies and gentlemen, Sorry. let's give her a proper intro. Rachel Miner! One, eight, seven, seven, cars for you. K-A-R-S cars again. One, eight, seven, seven cars again. Rachel Miner on the screen. All right. Now let's get a little audio test. Ra Rachel, how are you? Can you hear us? No, apparently not. Well, we can see you. We're gonna we're gonna stay here and get this right. She can't hear us. Or she doesn't have ears. I can't tell what she's saying. Um, I, I'm seeing you all. Oh, we hear you. All right. Well, we'll just keep working at this. Yeah. Okay. I don't hear you yet. Okay. We're going to work on that. Make sure you're talking to the that mic. That mic there. Just say something. Mike, make it meaningful. Hello, Rachel, can you hear me? Hi, yes, I can. Okay, this is the magic microphone, so this works. Magic Rachel can hear you, and we can hear Rachel, so this is going to go great. Rachel, thank you for being here. How are you doing? Well, it's so good to see you all. It was so exciting walking around, getting to see you. Good to see you as well. You look lovely as always. I'll turn you over to the audience. Rachel Miner, everybody. Hello. Oh. How are you? How are you doing? <laughs> Recording in progress. Excited to be here. <laughs> Very happy to see you too. Um, 
I was wondering if you are still working for Random Acts of Kindness and if there's anything new on the agenda, what you're doing with them. I am still the executive director of Random Acts. Um, it's the most amazing team. Uh, we're now, I think, 168 volunteers around the world, 27 countries. Um, just the most amazing, dedicated people doing so much good. It's hard to even know where to begin. Um, there, like I know we've got a big environmental initiative coming up, so wait for that. I'm really excited about that. Um, we're just, I, I, a lot of our focus is really making sure people understand the ACTS program. What we're there to do is connect you and enable you and support you in doing good within your community. Um, and we're so excited by that. That's the most beautiful thing is the array of amazing ways that people can get involved and create change. I'm so glad to hear that you're still with us. Yay, thank you. Yeah, absolutely, 100%. It's my entire life. My whore is there. So. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, hi. I think I'm too short. <laughs> How are you? <laughs> It's great to um, see you. It's so good to see you. Thank you for doing this. Thank you for like being up for it, playing this uh, new virtual version. And uh, I like to me, it's such a miracle getting to see all of you. Uh, I'm so and excited to hear you would be here like this. <laughs> Mood lighting. Thank you. Yeah, um, my question for you is, um, just if you were to meet Meg, how do you think that interaction would go? That's hilarious. We are kind of like, the antithesis of each other. Um, I don't know. I would hope that somehow it would go well. I feel like I tried to connect to her awareness and her sense of humor. I feel like I could connect to that. I think our views of the world would probably be uh, clashed terribly. Um, and she'd probably think I was a ridiculous human being. Uh, but, uh, but I would, um, I'd hope that at least like some of our humor and our sense of history, because I love history and she certainly has seen a lot and our uh, awareness of like humanity and sociology and things like that. Like maybe there would be inroads in those points. I don't know. What do you think? Oh. <laughs> I, I feel like I agree with what you're saying because I, I think it would be really cool to see a, like a back and forth with your guys' humor and to see you guys connect about things that maybe you can't always connect with someone who is quite opposite of you. Yeah, I mean, I think that's one of the challenges and one of the reasons I love playing characters mm -hmm. that are perhaps questionable. <laughs> um, I often play those uh you know, dubious, morally, uh, there's those morally dubious characters. Um, but I think it's so important as humans to never forget we all have these potentials in us. We're all trying to figure out uh, reality and we, uh, there's no such thing as like black and white. Um, and it's all just a matter of the choices that we make getting us in the places we are at um, and figuring it out together. Um, and I think being open to talk to anyone is, is something that's important to me and to understand and empathize. Uh, and so that's what I love about acting is you kind of get to go, well, like, how could I understand how this person or demon or whatever could get there? I love that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a beautiful, beautiful weekend. Okay, so I know Meg is a demon, but are there any qualities about Meg that you'd say you admire? Absolutely. Um, I love how loyal she is, because you can't, you can't fault that. She's like loyal all the way uh, throughout many, many years uh, and seasons um, to whoever she's working with. Um, and she's, I love that she's, um, as loyal as she is to Cass, even though she, she, I don't think she even understands that dynamic, but she has that ability, like when she really admires um, someone or some entity or whatever, to just uh, commit herself fully 
and without question. And she was unwaveringly brave too. Uh, and I really, really admire that. Um, and and uh, kind of the awareness of, to me, one of the things I loved about playing Meg is like in life we get so easily sucked up in like the drama of the moment uh, and the, the like things that feel really important in the moment and we lose sight of the bigger picture. And I feel like she always had more of a sense of the longevity and bigger picture. Does that make sense? Yes, it makes perfect sense. So, oh, yes, you it makes perfect sense. <laughs> Did, was there anything you admired about Meg? Um, definitely her loyalty, but um, I think the thing I admire most is her consistency. Like in other yeah. demons, I've seen their flip floppy, but I don't know. She was Meg through and through, and I loved her. I don't know. Well, and it, well, what's interesting is she was, even though there was a big arc of who she ended up supporting and things like that, and you might say she changed a lot, I think the qualities that made her Meg stayed completely consistent. Does that make sense? Yes. Yes, it does. Thank you. Thank you so much. Have a beautiful, awesome weekend. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Uh, I noticed you've got a good bookshelf behind you. What's your favorite book? I can definitely not give you a favorite because I am a crazy avid reader. I love to read so much. If you go on my Goodreads page, I have favorites. But like, to give you a favorite, I kind of need categorization and that gives you an idea of how much I read. Like, if you say like, your favorite nonfiction historical book or something like that. Um, I definitely, I love nonfiction uh, and I really get into, especially um, overviews of humanity and the kind of the macrocosm and also how can we do as much good in the world. So there are like, there's a book called, um, uh, I'm trying to remember, so I have a title because they all go through. I think it's hum Humans, um, and I can't remember what the rest of the title is, but it's on my Goodreads and I will write it out like, like tweet you or something after um, and, uh, and look it up. But uh, it's a really amazing book about kind of the, um, utopian ideas, the, the, the ways that we might be able to uh, change humanity for the better and like help each other more. And, the, uh, and it kind of debunks some of the falsehoods that keep us from being altruistic. Does that make sense? Absolutely. What's your favorite book? Um, my favorite book is actually like all of the Zane Grey like Western books like uh, Stage of the Purple Saga, like those kinds of books. I love westerns. Awesome. I don't. I have not. I don't think I've read a western. It, I really. It yeah, is. I really, it is really good. Yeah, that's re that's a really cool answer. I like that. Um, so yeah, I have to check those out. And and you like said books I don't know. So now I'm really <laughs> interested. <laughs> Thank you. Take care. Hi, Rachel. Hey, how are you? Um, I'm good. I'm going to actually let you choose which question I ask you because one might seem a bit personal and deep advice question, and yeah, the other I'm is kind of silly. Yeah, okay, I'm open for personal. That's fine. That's okay. okay, so what? between tonight and the last time I had an interaction with you, I was diagnosed with a chronic illness, and it's been kind of difficult for me how do you how do you keep yourself being positive when you're going through really big episodes of something that just it's so hard to get over sometimes by the way i'm really sorry you're going through that no no it, it's okay it's just um no i do a big inspiration in me so i would really like your advice well, when it comes to the positivity. Like, I do not recommend it to anyone as like a party favor. Um, you know, chronic illness, it's, it's, it's not the best. But, uh, but there are a lot of beautiful things you can get out of it uh, if you keep kind of searching for the lessons and the things that are important in life. One of the things that I love that it does is it really kind of, you, you're forced to choose what is important to you because you just don't have the 
energy or ability to put a lot of time into things that aren't, if that makes sense. So I really found that across these years, I've had to just choose what's the most important thing. And a lot of that is joy and connection. And so it keeps me, it keeps me honest and it keeps me true to the things that are really important and that I really value. Um, but it's not an easy road. <laughs> Um, and and uh, to answer how I stay positive, I don't always stay positive. I think across a day, I have ups and downs. I'm someone who, to me, I find it helpful to really vent. Like when I'm feeling like I'm really struggling or something, and I have some real struggles constantly. So like if I'm falling, I'm on the ground, I can't get up, and I'm, you know, everything seems to be falling apart or whatever. And I have those moments, I let myself cry. I might scream, I might get really angry, I might curse, I might whatever, but I kind of vent it out. And I don't take more than a minute, you know, and then I go about my day and I find that helpful. So rather than trying to force myself to be positive, it's like let myself feel what I'm feeling and then get on because I don't want to be stuck in that. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Thank you so much. Yeah, and, and I wish you so much luck. Thank you. Have a good weekend, Rachel. Take care. Hey, how are you? Hi, Rachel. I'm good. Um, so first off, I wanted to thank you. Um, my sister passed away a couple years ago, and you gave me some really, really sweet words on, on Twitter, so I do appreciate that immensely. Um, but my question for you is, how excited were you to come back in season 15 to play The Empty? I was unbelievably excited, but like beyond excitement, I was really moved. Because it just says a lot about the qualities of the people in this group. They fought really hard to make sure I was able to be a part of it and uh, found a way um, even with my disability and everything. And that's, um, I just hope we see more of that in the world. Um, that kind of loyalty and camaraderie, camaraderie and um, quiet support. Like they never make a big deal about it, but I always felt supported and um, loved beyond what I could expect. Um, and I really, really like, to me, that's what that all meant. Um, and it also meant a lot to be able to say, and including doing this, like to say, hey, there are always ways that we can be part of the world, whatever's going on in our life. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Absolutely. And we're so, so glad that you're back. I've missed your smiley face. I, I'm so happy to see you. Thank um, you so much. Glad to hear those words help. None of it's easy. I don't think that's what, that's one thing that like, I certainly the last years have told me from my own perspective, but also like from working with so many incredible staff members and all this that, um, I think we're all going through it. I think we're all at capacity and we all have trials in our own ways. Um, there is a Buddhist parable that I love, which is a, a woman who loses her son and she goes to Buddha and she said, I will do anything, just bring my son back and tell me how. And he says, just bring me a spoonful of salt from a home where no one's lost anyone. And she says, no, that's so easy, of course. And of course, like 15 years later, she's traveled around and she hasn't found one home where no one's lost anyone. And she realizes she's not alone. Right. Oh, and I think that's the lesson we all can learn. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. Thank you so much. <laughs> Lots of love to you. Hi, Rachel. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Very good. Um, so, go ahead. <laughs> um, as an avid reader myself, I kind of have noticed people tend to fall into categories. They yeah. either stick with one book and that's the book they're reading, and they read it till they're done, or they tend to read multiple books. And I was kind of curious, which camp you fall in? I tend to be a multiple book person because, well, I did, I was for years. 
because I like comparing things, especially like seemingly disparate subjects and whatever, but seeing the similarities and the stories in the the lessons we're learning in the whether you know like I often read like a science and a history and uh, current and historical whatever and there's so many things we're often looking at that are overlapping like it amazes me to read uh, Greek philosophy and go oh we're still asking the same questions now um, you know all of these things but on the other hand so my brain lights up with that but on the other hand in the last few years I've been trying more and more to stick with one book till I finish it but read more quickly does that make sense um so but that's by force I'm the same way <laughs> I'll forget <laughs> that I'm reading something and put it down and then I have to go back and reread it because I'm like wait what happened who did this so I understand completely I've had to force myself to like this is the one until it's done because you've had to reread 300 pages to figure this out yeah. Thank you. That's definitely no fun. <laughs> um, but like, I, again, it's like from a memory point of view. It's, to me, the thing I've tried to make sure is that I like internalize the lessons and I don't go past things I don't like deeply understand the meaning of because um, I find that I might forget the specifics. I'm really bad with names and su such, but... Um, but I do take away, my, my life is changed and who I am is changed by whatever I've read. Does that make sense? Thank you. Take care. Hi, uh, my question for you today is when you took over Meg, you took over a character from another actress. Did you consider that like a challenging thing, something that was already created and you had to make it your own or how did you feel about that yourself? I feel really lucky because when, when I came into it, I didn't have any sense of kind of like how, what a what responsibility it was. I mean, um, Nikki had done such a beautiful job uh, and uh, and the fandom loved her and everything. And I think I would have felt a lot of um, maybe like debilitating anxiety about like, can I live up to this? But I really didn't know that much. I was working so much at the time and, and running from thing to thing. I didn't know that much about it. I learned in retrospect and I absolutely fell in love with it. But I, I feel lucky because there was a consistency in that I got the writing. They did such a good job. I got the character and I think that um, hopefully I didn't completely like drop the ball in terms of having some consistency of character, but no, I hadn't studied and I didn't have the weight of that on my shoulders at that time. That's awesome. I think you did an amazing job. I love how your character like switches and like with Cass and everything. And I thought you were amazing and I love everything you do. So have a great day. Thank you so much. I think your shirt is amazing. Just have what? Um, it's my like Charlie one. Sorry. <laughs> Love it. Hey, Rachel, how's it going? Thanks. Thank you for doing all this. Uh, I really appreciate it. So oh, I, I appreciate, no, thank you for being open to it. It's, yeah, you know, yeah. No, it's, it's, it's definitely different. This is, uh, this is my first convention uh, for Supernatural, so this is oh, wow. definitely interesting, but I'm glad you're here because you're definitely one of my um, favorite characters on uh, that regard. You're one of the people I wanted to meet. So I'm glad I can in some capacity. And welcome, and welcome to the <laughs> virtual version. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's definitely cool. But um, so my question is, uh, I don't know if you watched the Winchester show at all, but yes, I uh, it introduced the concept of alternate realities and things of that nature. So based on going back to the show Supernatural, where there was an indication that Castiel and you had some type of feelings for each other or was hinted there, do you believe that in some alternate reality that Cass and Meg are together? And if so, what would that look like? Absolutely, I do, because it's like, I, I love those two characters together, but I also love the fact that that leaves room for something. So something that has bothered me, like as much as I, uh, I really couldn't love this fandom more, um, I don't like when there is like a sense of 
hey, I love these two characters together, but you love another two characters, and therefore our universes can't like meet and we can't understand each other. I'm really big on the, hey, can't it all, like I, I'm big on the, can't it all exist? It's all like, there's room for all of it. The more we create, the more it exists. Um, and certainly I don't want to please anyone's uh, fantasies. Um, and so, um, so I absolutely love, the, like I love the cast gene story, but I also love the cast make story. So it would be perfect to me if there was an alternate reality where they were together. I, I think it would be hilarious. <laughs> um, I've said in other things, I think that the funniest thing was how bad both of them are at like pretending to be human and also at like understanding their feelings for each other. And so it, it would be really hilarious to see like the domestic versions of making cats, like, you know, going on a road trip, having kids, like those kind of things like that to me would be the funniest show. So I want that reality to exist out there. That's something you should pitch. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> okay, I will. Thank you. Take care. Have a beautiful time. Hello, Rachel. Um, we're, you? Going, we're going way back in time to your childhood. When I first watched it was on Guiding Light. And, oh. Uh, uh, <laughs> yes, I was much younger, too, than uh, my mom was a viewer. And I'm curious in terms of, obviously, there was people on there who obviously set an example for you, like, as an actress and how to conduct yourself on set. And we could yeah. talk about the... the First kind of question is, was there anybody on the show who set an example in terms of like um, like charitable thing, that kind of thing in terms of, because I, I, I'm, you know, I used to go to their cons, um, and I know that there's actors on that show who were very involved in different, um, so it was different kind of charitable things. So I was wondering if anyone was an inspiration for you in that aspect. Not, I'm I guess to you could just... I know it was, I know that I, it was the first time I got to do some charity events and stuff. Like, we would do charity baseball games, and um, it did stuff for, like, the USO and um, various cancer societies. I know it also gave me the power that uh, when I was nine years old, so I became a vegetarian because um, I loved animals so much. And I was trying to rescue every animal I could. That was my passion at the time, I think, because I didn't have the power as a child to feel like I could really affect change on humans. It was like animals were my thing 100%. Um, and, and so I started when I was nine, um, again, because I was like in that position where I had something, some, some platform and sense that I had could make money, so I didn't need people to give me presents, so I stopped asking for presents and would only ask for money to my favorite animal charities. And we were doing, chari we did some work for like, there was an organization called Popcorn Park that was like, a, uh, took in a lot of abused and abandoned animals. And, uh, and so I was always working with them. And to me, that was the most exciting thing. And there were people, there were other people who, helped show me that was possible. But I think it was, I remember it more as a group thing that was very much within that group. There were so many people that we would do these events together that it taught me, oh, I have the power to be able to do that. And it was so exciting. Does that kind of answer your question? Yeah. yeah. Yes, very good. Thank you. Thank you so much. Was there some way I, I well, I, Wanted to know, was there someone who was a big example for um, you? Well, with the animals, I knew Grant Alexander was someone who I was, was going to say, yes, I was, I was, I was, yeah. event with Grant Alexander, and I'm trying to remember, it's the guy from Saturday Night Live, who was his friend. Oh, gosh. I don't, I don't remember. Anyway, I, but, but yes, yeah. Grant Alexander did the animal stuff. Yes, okay. <laughs> awesome. I love it. Hello. Hello. So it's funny. Hello. Hello. I vaguely zoned out a little, tried to remember my question, and then all I heard was, Alexander did the animal stuff, and now I'm a little curious now. <laughs> Sorry, just wanted to make you feel like you were here again. <laughs> that sounds like a much more interesting story. I like that one. Um, have you read the Dresden Files? 
I have not, but I know of them. Because I've been, because I'm in those circles that, that with D and D and all that stuff, and I've heard like there's good fairy content and like fun. Like, oh, so are you? Have you read them? Yes, there's such nerdy uh, pop culture references. Yes, yeah. actually, uh, the shirt I'm wearing is from is a fairy named Toot Toot who loves pizza. That's brilliant. And it's I love kind of that. set in Chicago, so. <laughs> I would, I know I'd love that because you know, like I'm big on Feywild stuff and um, like, you know, I I, um, I had a character, rolled up that character that was Eladrin, that was, I got really into the, big into the fairy, um, you know, elf, whatever section of, of D&D, so I'm sure I'd love it. Do it. He, it starts off his writings, not necessarily the greatest, but he gets better. With his books. Nice. They're great. Nice. Do it. Nerds I mean, all the way. <laughs> you, I, I, you, know, you know, I always appreciate your nerdy questions. You don't lead me astray. <laughs> Say, guys, good to see you. Hi. It's, I don't, I don't it's, know. It's me again. I just use my wife as a decoy. Okay. Oh, awesome. Okay. I love that. Well, you can both, either both ask whatever. I love that you're here. Do you, are you both fans of the show? No, it's me. <laughs> uh, yeah. You're just like an amazing supportive companion. Awesome. Brilliant. Do you have a favorite show? Yeah, actually like um, Soldier Boy and The Boys. That's my show. Yeah, The Boys. That's awesome. That's brilliant. That works. <laughs> okay, so my question is, I'm going to try to phrase it properly. So. You're Rachel Miner, like executive director of Random Acts, obviously a heart of gold. So how did you get into the mindset of playing Meg the Demon, who is almost the opposite of you, if you think about it? Thank you. I love that. I love that. I appreciate that. I don't know about heart of gold or whatever. It's like, I am what I am. But, um, but I definitely know we, we're very different in our views of humanity. But on that note, like, so there's, um, there's a... Well, I love um, by a man named Thomas Mer Merton that was like, love, hate the sin, love the sinner. Um, and I always love that about humanity. Like, I think we're all a mixed bag of like, you know, hey, some of us, we, we mess up, we go down this road, we try this thing, I've got this flaw, none of us are perfect. Um, uh, May certainly wasn't uh, as a you know demon or whatever, but um, there's stuff you can connect to and understand in each of us, and so I think that challenge is really important. Um, so I, I love the exercise of finding the beauty in any of us, and also finding how we can miss up because I think it's important to look at that. Does that make sense? Yes, yes, yes it does. Cool. So, uh, so, yeah, so that, 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 I guess, does that kind of bring it all together? So like, to me, they're actually, um, they support each other. Yes, yes, thank you. Have fun. Hello. Hi, Rachel. Hey. Um, How so, are you? I'm good, I'm better now that I'm talking to you. Oh, thank you. Um, so, you said you were okay with questions that were a little bit more personal. Is that still okay? I, I, I actually kind of love that. Okay. <laughs> so... Yeah, no, I think I, I'm not good at superficial talk. I'd rather, like, tell so, like a... Yeah. So, my dad was in a motorcycle accident uh, two weeks ago, and I almost wasn't here today. Um, because he just got out of ICU, and he's adjusting to life in a wheelchair. Um, and he's not, he's not doing horrible at it, but he's very much, he's not used to it. I wondered if you had any advice for that kind of transition. Well, first of all, it's huge, and I wish you both so much luck. I think it's sometimes harder to be in the position you are because it feels harder to be, to, to create any effect on it. and it's hard to watch the people we love going through things um, that we can't fix you know um, but remember that there's so many valuable lessons if he's open to it 
um, in finding kind of the truth of who he is. Because we, we walk around with all these things we think we are based on like the boxes that we take on the exterior that, you know, and when those are taken away, we have to rediscover like, who are we really? Because it wasn't, I'm not my legs. I'm not whatever, you know, physical prowess I had or all of that, that who are we apart from? Um, I think the biggest thing is he's got to, I think for any of us, we have to stay in the moment we have to not try to, we, uh, we have to appreciate what we've had, but not cling to it or try to recreate it. And life is only frustrating and will be unbearable if you're constantly trying to fit some ideal that you had before. Um, but if you're open to kind of rewriting and finding your story based on what's available at the moment and finding the joy in the present, because it's always there. Um, there's so much life to be had. Does that make sense? Yes, I love that so much. Thank you. So I really, I really wish you two so much happiness. Because yeah, just remember that, like, no matter how hard things might seem, they're not a reason you have to be upset. You have to be miserable. Like, I'm always trying to, like, for me, I'm like, why do, okay, all this is going supposedly wrong. I know everyone says it's wrong, but like, I can still be happy and I want to still be happy. Um, so uh, find the joy, like you're still together. Uh, maybe it's a beautiful day, or maybe you love looking at the water. You can still look at the water or whatever it is. Just keep looking for in every moment, what is the thing that is joyous? What can you make out of it? Uh, and think of it as a creative challenge. I love that. Yeah, he's hit every challenge head on, so this one's no different. And it's hard love to see it. him struggle a little bit more, but thank you so much. I'll definitely pass that on to him. Thank you. Hi, Rachel. Hi, how are you? I'm great. How are you? I'm so good. I'm so happy to be here. Me too. This is my first convention, so I'm so excited. Oh, welcome. Thank you. Um, I regularly use music as an escape or to kind of cope with a lot of things and so I like to ask people what was your first concert and what is your favorite concert that you've ever been to? It's awesome. They might be the same. My first one was a Radiohead concert uh, in Los Angeles. Um, it was really special and fun. Um, and it was like the OK Computer days. Um, and I really I enjoyed that. Um, I'm trying to think. I, I love, I actually love classical music and stuff too. So there's a lot of like classical music performances that I really enjoy. Um, I just think anything where you, you forget yourself and you get lost in, in that, the beauty um, uh, is, worthwhile um, and uh, transcend. Um, I would love to go back in time and go to like a Beatles concert or something. But again, like I don't love, I, you know, crowds and stuff like that. I'm physically like, it's just no, not a lot of fun. So it's more that like when the music just takes you away and I just, I know in the Radiohead concert, there was moments like that where I just forgot myself. Thank what you. about you? Oh yeah, uh, my first concert was Cher. It was supposed to be one of her last tours, but then she went on. Um, and then my favorite concert that I've been to is AJR. Nice, yeah. I love it, Thank love you. it. Well, and have a beautiful, amazing weekend. Thank you so much, Rachel, bye. Uh, hey Rachel, hey. I wanted to ask you, um, what was your favorite scene that you shot on the side of Supernatural? Oh, that's a really good question. I had so much fun with so many scenes. I would say my, I've got three that are coming to mind. The first, cause it was so much fun getting to be there and work with uh, Jensen and Jared for the first time and stuff. And I got to do a lot of like fight sequences and that. And at that time I could do all my own stunts and it was really fun. Um, and uh, that was, that was the one where I show up and 
I, I kiss Jensen too. I think he says it tastes like peanut butter. It was not a sexy kiss. <laughs> um, but, but, uh, but then I had a big fight with Jared, which was really fun to like imagine that I could beat up Jared. Uh, <laughs> we're so tall and whatever. Uh, and, uh, and then the last scene with Go Save My Unicorn uh, and that scene with Jared was so lovely. I liked working with him so much. Uh, and then the kiss scene with Misha was a lot of fun. And not, not just because there was a kiss. I just love that story. I love um, when she really starts stepping up um, to help the guys. What about you? Do you have a favorite? Definitely the kiss scene. <laughs> Well, for that reason, I, I really like the storyline, too. Like, Megan Cass had so much chemistry, and I really wish that the show could have done more with that, you know? Yeah. No, I agree. I, I really enjoyed it. And it was just so fun because it was not, like, your standard kind of relationship. Like, like, to me, I don't think of it as a gendered relationship because both of them probably were very different genders throughout their time. And I don't think they knew, like they even knew, neither of them knew what a relationship even was or what these feelings were that they were having. Like it was just fun to watch these two beings kind of try to figure out what the draw was and the magnetism. Does that make sense? Oh yeah. Oh yeah, I mean, Castle's a billions of year old entity. Like why would he know what a relationship was like? <laughs> Yeah, and same, and she was the same kind, of, same kind of bewildered. So, yeah. Anyway, thank you. I hope you have a beautiful time. You too. Hi, Rachel. I wanted hey. to know uh, what are the three things you're most grateful for today. Um, I love that. It's a beautiful question. Um, I am grateful to be able to connect uh, with you all just deeply. Uh, it's an incredible joy for me. Um, I'm so grateful for all the inc amazing hearts and amazing people that have helped make sure that I could be here uh, and have just been so supportive um, and have embraced this. I feel like so many people could have, there's so many ways that people could have written me off and to still include me is just such an incredible gift and to know people with parts like that. Um, and I'm so grateful for the random X work uh, and just being able to wake up every day and feel like I can make a difference in the world um, and that I can help other people know that they can. Um, so that, I guess that's, that's my list, but can I also add my cats? I'm very grateful for my kids. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Yes, come on up. Hello there. Hola, como estas? I don't know if you understand Spanish, but I just asked, how are you? Yes. yes. <laughs> um, so first of all, just thank you so much for making yourself available to us. Um, I think it's very inspiring to see you, to continue to be here. And it's very inspiring for everybody else that sees you as well. Um, so my question for you is, you're obviously an actress. You obviously love reading. Have you thought about becoming an author and writing something? I, I have. I've thought I've definitely, my entire life, um, it's writing is something I love, but it's also because it's something I love. It's, it's uh, probably something that's too precious to me in that I come up with a lot of ideas, but it's never good enough. Um, I also, because I've read so much, it's hard for me not to write off like, why, do you, why does this need to be in the world? Because there are so many other people who've done it better. Um, or, but, um, but I think the main thing is like for me, over the last couple of years is figuring out where to put my energy on a daily basis, um, where I'm going to be able to create the best change. I'm open to it being through writing, but even writing takes a lot of like, I've got to strategize physically just so that I can make it through that time of like sitting up and 
uh, doing, like, there's so many things, and uh, right now I've been finding the random acts work to be hugely rewarding, and to feel like to put my limited amount of energy in a day toward that, I feel like I really see the change, and it doesn't, it's not about me. I just get to support other people in flourishing uh, and being the change themselves. Does that make sense? Absolutely, it does. Thank you so much. So, thank you. Thank you. It's a beautiful question. Hi, uh, I'm Kimberly. I'm really nervous. So, uh, oh, Ben, please, uh, please, please uh, be as nervous as you want to be, but also you don't have to because there's nothing you can say wrong. Um, I wanted to know uh, how different it is playing a hero and a villain and which is more fun to interact with the other characters. Love that. Um, I love the challenge as, as, uh, as of being a villain because I do love kind of the mental acrobatics of trying to figure out, okay, why is this okay? Why would this be okay to this person or entity or whatever? Um, what would, what, series of things would occur to make that exist um, and make that a valid take on existence. Because I don't think any of us walk around like twirling our mustache like, we're going to be evil today. It's like, no, you, they think it's actually the right thing to do because that is justified by the world around them. Um, so I don't think there's like a huge, I, I think it's, there's a lot of gray. I don't think there's a huge difference between the hero and the villain in terms of it's just a different series of things that get us to these conclusions. Does that make sense? Um, but I, I will say I get, I get pleasure out of doing, playing the hero because there's some part of me I don't know that lights up of like feeling like I'm on the side of helping people are doing good. Um, so there is a personal satisfaction to that, um, though I enjoy the challenge of the other. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Okay, I rambled a lot, so I was the one who should be nervous, not you. <laughs> Thank you. Take care. Hi, this is my first time doing this. I was just wondering what your cats' names and what kind of cats they are. Oh, very good question. So <laughs> their names, and I could talk endlessly about my cats. So their names are Merlin and Gwen, Merlin and Guinevere. Um, they're, they're bambinos.